Chapter three, roundtable podcast, small arms, Danny at so, Trey speed, graphic gangster himself, Cole Susack. We're back, man. That was a long chapter. Yeah. I, uh, you know, there, I was spitting some bars. I was not be not able to read real well, but we're, we're getting it together. How fitting is it right now that it's called how I built confidence and yeah. you have your shirt off right now? Well, yeah, I just, currently have my shirt off while we're doing the audio book after I just got done lunging, but I'm not really confident about reading out loud. Yeah. So yeah, no, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a, lot, of, a but, lot of perseverance in that. I have yeah. a lot of perseverance <laughs> in this. And I'll tell you, by the time I'm done with this book, I will be more confident about reading. Now I used to read out loud at church when I was a little kid, I'd have to go up there and read out of the book, you know, grew up Catholic, but it's been a little while. And so, yeah. I mean, you know, luckily that you guys are my friends. It's, it's going to be an epic. Sure. You're laughing real. with me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not at me. Mm -hmm. I can tell, yeah. except for Trey. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, I, well, all right. What'd you guys get out of that chapter? Cole, we'll start with you. You've been, you've been man, making notes. This, uh, yeah, man, I have a highlighter. I'm going fucking in on this chapter. Appreciate um, that. I, I just, overall, this chapter is super fucking dense. There's a lot to take away, especially the last half of the part. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess like we should just uh, start from right at the beginning. Right in the beginning, you said that, you know, finding relevant information is a super huge part in staying up to date on that and looking at who's the best, trying to learn from the best. But then you also said you're like an unending student of the game. Mm -hmm. Can you can you talk more about that? Yeah, I mean, even in real time as we're recording this, we just tweaked to try to pull on Fridays when this is the programming. So like I'm never all the way set. I would say like our protocol overall and like my overall way I operate is pretty in like in concrete of what I think works, right? Whether it's my daily operation in the morning from the time I get up to when I eat to when I read to like to how we train. But when I see things and I'm learning from people or I see, I'm going to always try things. So I don't ever think, I think when you believe you know it all, you might as well quit because that's impossible. So I'm always going to attempt to read deeper, deeper or evolve, or I'm learning. I can still learn stuff from you guys. I can still learn stuff from the guys in the gym. I don't really ever think that because I've ascended to a certain spot that I'm like, I'm always going to know more. It's, it's, it's virtually impossible. That's like the ultimate arrogance really. So I, I when I started taking that more of approach, like really observing things when I'm around people and I can implement little pieces, man, hundred percent. I mean, I even tried it a couple times. I remember thinking like, do I need to take like a fucking 20 minute nap to, you know, be better? But I felt more tired. So that didn't make sense for me. But some people who get up early, like I do, they need that. Or do I need to take coffee at three o'clock? No, I don't need caffeine. Like I've really looked at this whole process, like a science project entirely. So I think like if you're around really smart people when you can grab pieces of things like you should try the trial and error is ever ever evolving i think yeah and you said like the having the proper education and i guess like trying to learn what you do in your skill like maybe it's at your job or mm -hmm. the business you want to be in that's like the ultimate thing because a lot of the times if you get like a client that needs something and you have studied as much as like as much as possible, then you know, yeah. you know, hey, maybe this is a solution for you. If you go into some business meeting and there's a guy who is doing the same thing that you do, you can outwin him if, you know, he starts talking stuff and he's completely wrong. You can better gauge the entire situation if you really dive in on what you know. Think about this. If we talk about traditional school for a second, when you study for a test and you go in, you know the answers. How confident are you when you take the test? You fucking A it, right? You should be really doing that in your fucking job. So like if I'm going to go into a meeting and here's the other thing is the other experience I, that I think I can, the game I can kind of talk about is if you don't know it, like, I think there's a lot of value in just saying, I don't know it, or it depends on what the environment is. But like, if I really know some shit, I'm about to fucking lay it on you. If I don't know it, I'm going to either, I either have somebody <laughs> on my team that knows it, or then I'm going to go deeper so I can know it or experience it. And part of like kind of back to the dieting whenever I didn't understand intermittent fasting, people kept asking me about it on Twitter. I made myself do it so I could answer it because I didn't have the right answer. I, what was I gonna say? Oh, I don't like it. Oh, it sucks. Well, I never tried it before. Mm -hmm. So like, I think the trial and error, like I got onto that early when I started dealing with Dr. Eric Serrano, that changed everything for me. I've looked at my entire life that way because then if it doesn't work, I don't feel like a failure if it doesn't work. I feel like I just learned something that I can teach to people. And a lot of people need to like, I think, approach things that way. But digger, digging 
deeper on the craft so you can be more confident in your business and is, is massive. Yeah. Massive. And if you come across something that you don't understand, just saying you don't understand actually shows that you're confident in trying to figure it out. Yes. You can just say, I don't understand this yet, but I will. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, fi I'll find this solution for you. And I think that there's a lot of power in that because then people in the room look at like, oh shit, like he doesn't feel like he always has to be right or know everything mm -hmm. because it's, once again, that's impossible. So I think like being real honest with yourself on that's pretty big, but knowing you're going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know about squatting every day till I went through it. You know what I mean? I couldn't talk on it. So I try to like be real careful about that kind of stuff till I can experience stuff. So it's good. I think that's really kept you in your own like category and like, like sustainable growth and everything because like sure. if you haven't like tried out like different methods or different variations and stuff that you you, you saw at the 4am crew or john bruce whatever yeah. like what you know you're just going to become like everyone else doing three sets of 10 or what, what, whatever yeah. it is you know what i mean i never in my entire life wanted to be any like anyone else yeah i was me you know what i mean authentic and i knew i was different i knew i wanted to be different i had zero interest in following the pack yeah like zero zero so like when it came to programming and training i was like Look, we deadlift on Mondays in a conjugate because Louie proved that it worked. And then I tried it and it worked. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to fucking change it. Yeah. But I didn't like some of the other stuff. So I changed it. You know, we've utilized the Bulgarian stuff with the front squats. Like, it's just one of those things where that trial and error has now led us. I was talking to AG with, about this today. He came at 4 a.m. and I was taking him home and I go, yo, you guys are walking into like the finished process. I am watched it this morning. High school kids pulling 455, 585, like... I'm like, dude, you guys walked into almost a finished protocol. You don't even understand it because you don't know any better. This is just how you operate. You front squat four days a week. You do bands. That's just how he lifts because that's mm -hmm. the start of it. So it's like I just saw the finished protocol on some young dudes that didn't even lift two years ago. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and so it's unbelievable to see that evolution. But we don't get there if I don't get half things broken off me. If Cole doesn't go through, like that's how we got there. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So anyway. So kind of going off of that is like the – when you talk about from an early age, how it's like so critical. So like with AG yep. or like Madeline, or, you know, and yeah, like well, talk about that for a little with, bit with AG. I think like, that's why I had him go sit in with Joe. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to get him around. Like I didn't have a guy I could go sit on uh, as a personal trainer in high school and see if that's a job I wanted to do. Obviously the resources are different now, but it's like, I want him to go sit with Joe. I want him to talk with John Yoles. I want him to like, be able to be around that stuff enough to go like, ah, oh, is this what I want to do? Cause he has a liking in finance and it's like, go see what they do. You know what I mean? Like I, I just, even as easy as that resource is, which is shadowing and interning or whatever, like we're all been through it. And, but that was not, somebody wasn't saying to me when I was getting the job at the lumber mill, Hey gee, you know, you should go sit in on a training session at the local gym. Yeah. So yeah. like, it's unbelievable that that, so you have to have those resources um, for these young people or like, that's why I love having these kids come pack orders here. Cause I don't, yeah. I don't know how many entrepreneurs are in that group, but I guarantee if there's one in there, he's going to fucking never forget this. Yeah. The mm -hmm. way we operate, the way that we're pumping out content, the fucking, how much fun we have, how fucking cool this shit is. They're not going to forget that shit. And then they're going to know, wait, that's what's possible because you know, you kind of maybe know, or you don't know. So it's like, but I know somebody from that group is going to be like, all yeah. right you know what yeah. i mean and so i take a lot of pride in that for sure yeah so like how did your confidence change though like once you got to columbus state because you got the exercise specialist certificate yep. there but you said that before that though you didn't know like any personal like you mean you didn't know like any personal trainers or anything so like what was it like to get there and then to see like other people that wanted to do something similar in their life mm -hmm. as well as just being surrounded by those people that was so awesome trey even though i was half a fucking mess because yeah. I, I had just moved away from home so i was acting a fool like guy away from college but um shout out don labenthal he kept me in school but the um what what was awesome is i was like okay here's a group of people that want to do the same thing i want to do and for lack of sounding like a dick I thought I was probably more knowledgeable than everybody in the room. And I still didn't even know that much. Right. Mm -hmm. And so as I was learning from Dawn and the other professors there, I started to realize, okay, I've got one year to get whatever out of my system, being away from home, get my shit together. And then I can be into the workforce and actually have the piece of paper. Cause I didn't know if I'd ever even go to school. But when I was like, man, I can, I can make it through one fucking year, especially if I'm learning about lifting and so when I felt like I actually had a path, that felt amazing to me. Cause not only did I have a path, I paid for it from the coal mining money. So like 
I felt very empowered by paying for my rent on campus, one check for the whole year. It's like three or four grand. Boom, wrote it. Came to Columbus State, paying each you know quarter. Boom, whatever, 700, 800 bucks. Like paying for all, like I felt like my, my world was really mine. That like no one owned me, that it was all on me and that I actually like had control of it. Now I was a little out of control because I was drinking and shit when I first got here. But the reality was like I knew I was in control enough and that I had a real path. And that felt amazing because when you don't have any outline, you feel lost, especially in a job. You don't know anyone that has it. Yeah. So that really, I think, opened up my like ideas of what I didn't like, though, is at that point, 20 years ago, though, trainers weren't making money like they're making now. So Don or whoever was in there talking about, yeah, when you get out of here, you know, probably make like 30 grand or whatever. And I'm like looking around like, nah, that ain't for me. Like, I didn't even know why I felt that way, though. That's what's <laughs> funny. I just always thought, like, in a bigger way, right? So, but I think it definitely, it made me feel like, fuck. Like, all that work I just put in the coal mine, I'm actually on the path. Mm-hmm. Now I felt like I could be unstoppable if, when I got it together. You know what I mean? So, that, that was amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, like, you're, you know, over time, as you get to Columbus State, you're, like, it's, like, one block of personal confidence that's being yeah. built on top of each other. Being in the the room at first had like, and knowing I, I, I paid it. Yeah. It was a huge confidence boost for me. Yeah. Like you threw your fucking chips in. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So like one thing that I always love to talk about is like uncomfortable situations just because of, I I just think back through my, you know, reflect back through my life and stuff like that. So obviously you're reading people, you know, about Arnold Carnegie, Napoleon Hill. So you're getting more and more confident as time goes on. But like, Talk about just the exposure to those uncomfortable situations, whether it's, you know, leaving the tennis club Mm -hmm. and going to find your spot or like signing that lease to the new, you know, to the new place, like stuff like that. Cause like people are terrified of stuff like that or just getting up in the morning because you didn't used to do that. No, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So kind of, you know, talk about that. I think that I realized that when I got through these other uncomfortable situations that there was a blessing on the other side, I hadn't read that stuff from Napoleon Hill yet. I haven't got to like those part of the books. But that would already happen to me. Mm -hmm. So I was just really aware that like, all right, I went through really like that. Obviously, the job in the coal mine was huge, a huge like fucking thing for me, because when I got through how difficult that was and then all of a sudden a month later, I'm sitting in a spot because I was able to work enough to get there to give myself an opportunity to do what I thought was possible. Mm -hmm. So that was like, boom. So I'm thinking like when I would run into these situations that were real difficult, I would be like, all right, just find a solution through this because this is just like a barrier to what's on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. And so I really, even as stressful as stuff is, I try to look at it that way because I'm like, when I get through this, I mean, we just went through it, Mm -hmm. right? We just fucking went through it again here. Look at what we got going on now. So it's like when you get through that super stressful stuff and you figure it out, the the reward is what's there. Mm -hmm. And so I just always kind of, thought those things like even with the tennis club when I had my first job as a personal trainer and they want to take more of my money and I said fuck it I'm going to go open my own gym you know I really didn't have any other thought I, I don't know why I didn't really know what the fuck I was doing but I could not stand that that guy was going to take my fucking money mm-hmm. and I was just like fuck that yeah. and I literally walked right out that day and got in my car and started driving around looking for spots to open my own studio at 20. I mean that's like a, some ultimate level of confidence yeah. right there Cause I was like, well, you know what I knew? I knew he didn't know more than me. I'm telling you. Cause I, 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 I interviewed for that job. They didn't want to give it to me because I was 20, like to manage the gym and be a trainer. The gym is really small. So I mean, I could have done it, but I knew I knew more than that fucking guy. Mm-hmm. Undoubtedly. Like in, and this is at 20. I don't really know shit to be honest, but I knew I knew more than that fucking guy. And so I could not stand that they weren't willing to give me that promotion because of my age Mm -hmm. in that they they hired some out of shape dude that came from other, I was like, get the fuck out of here. So like I was, I think that I'm so competitive and I was like, so like pissed about it that that I, I relied on that to say, all right, gee, you got to this once again, small wins. I'm already personal training, like 15 people. Mm -hmm. This is already working. It's not working to a hundred thousand dollar level, but it's working. So why would I not think, Fuck it. Let me go to that next step. Um, but that all of these things on top of each other are what helped me make these other decisions. 
Yeah, I think that it just highlights like why it's so important to do hard things because you yeah. had you had that coal mining experience to it like made to compare different. it to, and you're like, well, fuck, it's not gonna be that bad, you no. know? No, and, so. and honestly, my B plan, which was never a B plan, was I just go back there. Just go back, yeah. Because look, if you told me I came up here and I never went to the coal mine, and if I didn't do well, I had to go to the coal mine. That's different, mm -hmm. because then that'd be scary too, because I'd never experienced it. I knew I could fucking do it. <laughs> Actually, I knew I was good at it. Yeah. So like, could I have been a coal miner for 20 or 30 years if I lived at a different time? Probably. And probably been just fine. Yeah. So it's like one of those things where that didn't scare me either. Because I thought, well, fuck, I got to go back underground. I can work four on, four off, fucking double on my, I, I can still go make money. So I think like knowing what the, I guess, downside would be if I couldn't be successful, I'd already experienced it. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really that scared of it. So I think that probably also give me another level of confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, yeah, I, I cannot tell you how impactful that was. Like nothing to be afraid of pretty much. I yeah. wasn't, I wasn't afraid of yeah. it. Um, and I just thought like um, that, man, I, I didn't think I was going to start the process that early, but I figured why fuck not? <laughs> I mean, I just kept asking myself all these questions. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's it got pretty, easier for you yeah. over time, obviously, yeah, yeah, with yeah, figuring yeah. stuff out. Look yeah, at my, now. yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty baller. Like my friends were like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that comes on to <laughs> one thing that, you know, kind of resonated with me was being intentional and taking ownership and trying to make and put yourself in the best decisions that like, you know, if that guy's telling you that you need to do this, like how the fuck is that going to help you in your situation? Yeah. So trying to navigate through that. So can you talk about just operating yeah, I think, more in that space? Yeah. So being intentional about, um, what's your reference to Cole? What do you think? What do you? What do you kind of just like how how like uh, that guy coming and telling you that, oh. you know, he had to change that or you had to pay that how, like that's not helping your situation. No. So you like took a step back and was like, I need to fucking take action and yes. help me get to the okay. spot to where I want to be. I know what you mean. Well, yeah. So what I what I've done continually in my career and it might not have been the like I could have I, I took action that exact day. Right. And it was about a month later and I was out. There's other situations in my life that drug on longer, maybe because I had more money, you know, tagged to them or I didn't have the strategy. But usually when there's an event and that was an event, I knew I was done. Right. And then I have to like think to myself, all right, am I going to be a little bitch and just <laughs> fucking take it? Or am I going to go be really uncomfortable and take action and change it? And so I've ran into these a million times in my career over the last 20 years and there's some of them that you guys are fully aware of, but that was the first one that was like, okay, you know, I didn't even know the word entrepreneur. I'm pretty sure at that point, like, I don't even think that was like a cool term at all. Like, I think we just, they were just business guys, but I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to go do my own business. Like, I think that, um, and the fact that at that exact time, there was a very well-known trainer that was literally almost diagonal from the place I went to who wasn't successful and she spent like 25, 30 grand on her gym and she, it didn't work. And so that would, that had just happened. So that's who people were like putting me up against. Her name was Suzanne. I'll never forget. I'm like, fuck Suzanne ain't me. <laughs> 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 fuck, were you fucking kidding Shout me? Out. Suzanne, yeah. get the hell out of here. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, that, that taking that power though, I'll tell you what, when I found that spot and then, uh, I signed that lease and me and Rachel, because I was dating Rachel at the time, she's my girlfriend, we're in there painting the walls and like getting in, and the dream was like becoming alive. It felt like a fucking high that you could never like, it was just invigorating that like, once again, this was like my end game when yeah. I came here and it was happening so fast. No, it was at a very small level, but it was like, it was, it was still happening. It was yeah. very, very interesting and, yeah. and, and really cool. So okay. what else you guys got? I mean, I think we go to Arnold, right? Yeah, yeah. I was, I I was mean, just about to say, yeah, we got I mean, to Arnold. Let's talk, talk about uh, Poppy. Yeah. yeah about big <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, big Poppy. All right, let's talk about when you first, like, started reading this shit. Like, what was your first, like, mm. exposure to Arnold? Was it, like, an arm workout, chest yeah, what, workout? Yeah, what, what, was what was it? So, it was, um, it's funny because it was, it was actually, if I have to think back, I obviously, I knew who Arnold was, but I think... It was originally the Franco Colombo pamphlet series. So Randy, shout out to Randy, <laughs> when I was like 17, gave me um, Franco Colombo's pamphlet series, which is basically their eBooks. 
right? Yep. So, so awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was like it was nutrition from Sardinia. It was from Italy. It was I still have them at home. They're amazing. Oh, I'll bring so them good. in. Yeah. The book of chest, the book amazing. of arms, all by Franco, and it had obviously had Arnold in it too. Yeah. I think I got those first. I wasn't aware of the encyclopedia at that time. Mm -hmm. I got the encyclopedia next. Actually, my buddy Todd Crawford, shout out Todd Crawford, that's my guy. He um he had the book of encyclopedia. I think we kind of got those around the same time. Mm -hmm. So he was doing a lot of the encyclopedia workouts. I had got the pamphlet series from from Randy, and then combined, we started coming up with some like banger chest and back workouts, and really really getting it. And he had that two or that like thirty page Arnold poster in his room, the one that I have signed that I used to have in the old studio yeah. that I'm bringing mm -hmm. back. Um, that I tried to recreate, but it was like a fucking hundred racks. But anyway, so it was like, um, that was like kind of our first exposure to it because once again, there's no internet. Then I started buying muscle and fitness. I started, bu you know, buying the, the magazines on a regular basis, but it was Arnold encyclopedia. I didn't even know pumping and iron existed. No one had that book. Dustin's dad had the pumping iron book. So when, once I, you know, connected with Dustin, he had brought that out. So all between like my junior and senior year, was when we really got on Arnold. Up to that point, it was just whatever my grandpa showed me and what I had mm -hmm. seen my dad do, basically. Yeah. Okay. So then when was the first time you actually saw and met Arnold? Yeah, so we'll we'll call it Saw Him. Okay. My first Arnold Classic. So this is uh, 2000, probably, 99 maybe. Rachel works at Long's Bookstore on campus, which isn't there anymore, but it was a bookstore where you guys would go get your you know material for Ohio State. And she messaged, she didn't text me. I think she called me, but I didn't have text on the get. She, she called me and said, hey, my, uh, the guy I work with, his family friend runs the Arnold Classic. Do you want to sell programs at the door and then you can get free tickets? And I'm like, fuck, yeah. First of all, I didn't even know the Arnold Classic's here. I didn't even know what it is. Okay. But I mean, once I figured out, I'm like, uh, it's a trade show like with fucking supplements, of course. And it's here. <laughs> So yeah, I go yeah I go meet <laughs> I go meet um, his I forget his name I go and meet him and he hooks me up with Lucy who ran it all the way till like two years ago she's like really like in her eighties now That's amazing yeah her name's Lucy she's super cool so she hooks me up I'm selling programs and I get I get the VIP pass too which you get a picture with Arnold so I'm get I got tickets to like the night show I got tickets to everything bro I'm twenty I'm in here wow like I'm at the I'm at, I'm at the fucking Arnold right but I'm out here you know pushing these programs or whatever and uh, so the, I'm all hype I think I'm about to like chop it up with Arnold that ain't how that shit works it was like a fucking <laughs> conveyor belt like and it was a Polaroid bro so long ago I still have it and so you go and you literally like kind of walk by him stand in front of him they snap it and they move you on there's no like it was like because i don't know they might have had a thousand people pay for yeah. it right so I'm, I'm i'm working up i'm thinking like i'm about to have a real interaction no. that part of <laughs> yeah 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 but i do have a picture with him and i kept it and I, i've used it in some articles and stuff but that was the first time so that's when he he had just come off doing um some big movie or something but he didn't even look real it's like when basketball players talk about the first time they see mj it's like you, when they're playing against them, they're like, this motherfucker don't even look like a real person. Like, what's going on? So that's how it felt to me. It was like he was bigger than life. And, and you know, and I'm fucking 19, 20 years old. And I'm just like, damn. But I got by him. And I never thought, you know, at that point, that's all I studied. Like, that I'd even stand by this dude. And here I am working at the event and standing by him at 2021. So once again, at a, as a young dude, I'm in these areas thinking, yo, I'm just getting fucking started. You know, I'm in this motherfucker, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so that that right there was, that was once again, it gave me more thought of like, ooh, what's possible? Mm -hmm. So I go back into building my business and I'm like, motherfucker, I was just standing by Arnold. You know, let me get in these shows. Let me keep competing. Like I'm just continually building up my confidence. So it was awesome. I mean, I feel like we have to talk about the Arnold meeting real quick. Like, yeah, for sure. MP, I don't know that right? I talk about it in these other chapters. No, that's why I yeah, definitely yeah, wanted for to bring sure. it up because like that was like, almost like a pinnacle moment for you, right? No question. So yeah. kind of walk us through the meeting. Yeah. So um, the to give some context, um, you know, I was one of the co-founders of Muscle Farm, for you guys don't know, is a big supplement company, and we had a chance to pitch Arnold as our business partner. And um, Tom Arnold, the actor, is the one that set it up. Like we were golfing with him and golfing with his uh, brother-in-law, and he set it up. So Arnold comes, you know, and it's like, we're, we've already built the line. So we're walking in with a package that's unbelievable. All the branding, all the supplements, like 
our business is like over 50 million at this point. So we got a game, mm-hmm. but Arnold didn't do it with GNC has never done it with anybody, but Joe Weider. Joe Weider had just died a year before. And he said that he would not work with anybody in supplements basically until Joe passed. So that was like one of the things that had been about a year or so. Our business was really growing. We were a vendor at the Arnold Classic. He kind of knew what was up, right? But when you go to a meeting with your idol to be your business partner, like, I mean, that's a fucking at the top moment of all time. You walk in, so to, to paint a picture, you go to the office in Santa Monica, which is right across from the firehouse, which is like this really famous place to eat with all the bodybuilders in the 70s. And you walk in, as you walk to the fucking, the elevator, there's a mural of Arnold from Terminator 2 with a fucking machine gun, like at the elevator. That's so fucking awesome. So you walk up and you're like, yeah, I'm supposed to be here for, you know, Arnold or whatever. And he's like, you know, and then they let you in you go upstairs. When the door opens to the right side is, I believe it's called like Oak Productions or whatever, or something like that. And that's the guy who runs like all the money. He's got like LeBron, Bono, Arnold. He helped put the beat steel together, like heaviest of the hitters to the right. To the left is Arnold's office. And it's just got the governor's seal outside on the fucking door. (laughs) So you're like, and then as soon as you open the door, it's like a fucking unbelievable. All the movie posters, life-size Predator, life-size Mr. Freeze, life-size fucking, uh, what was the other one? It's fucking, I mean, just the, the Conan sword just sitting in the corner. Like, you're just like, and then when you walk in his main room, He's got like a pool table with the true lies playing over top. And then you see in the back of where it's like, it's like a TV, kind of like a big TV stand. It's got all his bodybuilding trophies, Mr. Olympia, best chest, 1973. I mean, like it looks like the trophies we win at our, at our yeah. tournaments, you know what I mean? Or whatever, our powerlifting meets. So all of that shit is going on and you're just kind of like, fuck, <laughs> you know, but what's interesting is there was definitely like an excitement with our entire group. And a lot of the guys were super nervous, but I didn't, I mean, I was so, I wasn't, I would say I was more excited than I was nervous because I was like, this is my fucking shot. It's your jam. I've been waiting for this. Right. Mm-hmm. And so when Arnold comes in, he, he comes in on time, he sits down and he goes, you know, he said, um, I didn't do this with anyone else. Why should I do it with you guys? I just kind of fucking sits there and we're all kind of like, he just punches us right in the fucking throat right out the gate after he says hello and he's nice. I mean, but he's just, I mean, he's a businessman, businessman. He's worth like a half a billion dollars. He's talking about his likeness and fitness. That's like fucking everything to him. Mm-hmm. So when he says that, I, I, I basically perk up and say like, Hey, you know, I just don't think that guys are training that hard anymore. I think we have a real good opportunity through this brand to bring back all the supersets, all the training, do the videos, re-interview like your stuff. He had just come off being governor. So he ain't done a lot of stuff. He barely was at the fitness classic because he re- he was busy being governor. So I, in my opinion, his stuff at that point in time wasn't as relevant as it was after the blueprint, at least in bodybuilding, right? That second, he's always the fucking goat. I'll never say like, oh, I helped him be relevant. That's not a fucking what I'm saying. But the younger kids weren't really onto his stuff as much, in my opinion, right? I wasn't. There you go. Yep. So, and I, and, I, and I knew that, right? Because I'm older than you guys. Mm-hmm. So I was like, but we can bring it back and go crazy. And so I said, the Get Swole plan is out right now. I just shot the trailer on it and it's already, you know, it's doing really well. Like the people are excited about it or the products are selling it or something like that. And he was like, well, can I see it? And I was like, sure. So we brought it up on the laptop and he's watching me on the fucking Get Swole trailer or whatever it is. And he asked me about it. He's like, oh, I saw you doing bicep curls this way, but don't you usually do, like he was like giving me some tip on bicep, like right out the gate. He's back in the gym. Oh yeah, yeah he's back yep. in the gym. And then... Uh, Mark Grousman, shout out Mark. He's the guy that hooked up the whole meeting. He had bought my Fitness RX magazine that was at um, the newsstands. Now it's a Fitness RX magazine. It's my best, probably my best day of my career besides this, or they're equal to um, with my kids on it. So it killed it, right? It's me and I'm shredded up. Me and my kids are on the cover of the magazine, major magazine, all newsstands, Barnes and Nobles, all airports, everything. I don't even fucking think to bring it. He buys it at the airport and brings it to the meeting. The timing of this is so fucking epic. There's no way I could even have thought that that would happen. That diet phase for that magazine was so fucking hard. And I, and I, and I, and I did that old school, shot the fucking cover, crushed it. It was like a dream type of scenario that I remember like 
doing a ton of the stuff where I walk in my pantry and I'm trying to fucking cheat on my diet, but I know I should. Like, I remember doing that. I had a lot of head mm-hmm. games going on, but I made it through it and I fucking blazed the eight hour shoot. Then my kids jump in the picture. They end up on the fucking cover with me. I mean, it's like a fucking storybook. He throws it to Arnold right as he's done closing the laptop. He goes, this is Corey just to give me like more credibility. And dude, the meeting stops and he grabs it and he goes, this is really cool. And I go, yeah, Arnold, I don't think anybody's ever done it before. You know, obviously he's a family guy too. I'm like with the kids. I'm like, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's like, like unbelievable. He goes right. Uh, I go, I go, there's a spread in there too. You can check out the gym. He opens it up and he sees the old, the original old school. And he goes, where's this at? I go, well, it's in Columbus, not too far from where the classic is at. And the, the meeting just kind of halts and he goes through every page. I mean, it's like a 10 page blowout of all these exercises. And then, then he pulls out the poster, the ab poster and tells me my, <laughs> so dude, so like that's where shit got real fucking weird. And I'm sitting there and, and I'm like, uh, on the couch. So I'm like, kind of, he's like at the head at the head, like a chair like this. And I'm on the couch and I kind of leaning forward as he's looking through stuff and he pulls out and I'm looking at myself and I'm like, Arnold Schwarzenegger is looking at a pullout poster of my abs right now. <laughs> <laughs> just think, of, just think about that yeah, for yeah, a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Turn, just think, turn the tables. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. dude, Jeez. my face is ready to blow off. And, and then he goes, your abs kind of remind me of Frank Zane's. And I'm like, like, what the fuck is happening? And so it was like, at that point, there was a credibility of family, conditioning, the gym, I think did a ton because he understood like the retro, like that, that's what I built. So he knew. And then we got to just kind of talking about bringing, I knew he owned Pumping Iron, all the footage, he has all Mm -hmm. the rights to it that we could remarket it and I wanted to go through all the footage and build out these programs and call the blueprint. We already had the blueprint set up, blueprint to mass, blueprint to cut. We pitched that whole thing. Um, I'm telling you after the magazine situation, I knew he was going to sign with us hundred percent. Um, and you know, pre pre like later on when we got a chance to like have breakfast and talk about it, he said that he was in at that point, as long as the business was halfway decent, you know, just because Mm -hmm. he knew, I knew what to do with his likeness. And then I even think the stuff that we produced was so high level with bodybuilding.com that even he was fucking excited about it. We wrote the blueprint to cut and blueprint to mass. I did two fucking unbelievable interviews. One at old school that did millions of views. One at his office, rap training programs. I mean, we wrote the training programs together. Like, fuck, are you kidding me? Like he was on a flight to Europe and I was sending him the blueprint to cut. I'm like, yo, I wrote the initial program. See if you want to change anything. He hit me back like, change this, change that. But like, man, this is fucking dead on. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's how I learned from his shit anyway. <laughs> so that kind of stuff was, um, really interesting in, in the first blueprint interview mm-hmm. was also the first night that I went to the Christmas party. So I was in the, I was in town doing business with him, but we weren't like homies yet. And he said, Hey, you're here. Why don't you just come to the Christmas party tonight? Now that's all he says. He didn't say like, Hey, it's black tie. He doesn't say like every fucking celebrity in Hollywood's going to be there. He didn't say anything. Just why don't you come up to the house? Sure, motherfucker. Let's go. I'm, I'm going to Arnold's house. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I go. I got a button up fucking Marshall's uh, polo shirt on I bought. Jeans. Fucking Kangle. And I just rolled to Arnold's crib for Christmas. I should have went. I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. <laughs> hey, this is not surprising. Oh, no. Not at all. So I roll up and everybody's suited up tied up all these fucking celebrities i mean stallone's there and fucking um man what's that one dude's name that was in hustle and flow uh he's a really big actor i was like in the bathroom line for him i had just watched the movie and i was like wow that's fucking right that guy right there and then the, <laughs> you know what i mean like i'm trying to downplay i go just hang out with the cigar guy because i'm just i don't know anybody that's how i got to be friends with him but i walked by tom arnold and he's always a fucking dick He's like, oh, jockey in a race tonight? Great hat. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, go fuck yourself, Tom. (laughs) And then the the best part was, and then we can go to something else, was there's this guy started talking to me. And I was like, I'm thinking, why does this motherfucker want to talk to me? Right? I don't know who he is. He was a fucking stylist. He thought I fucking styled myself. And I was like some Hollywood dude. I didn't know how to dress. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) jeez. Wow. So, wow. oh yeah, that amazing. was amazing. That was a director's <laughs> cut right there. That oh, was so good. dude, yeah. unbelievable. It's a great story. But I'll tell you, the last one about that story was 
after I got my cigar lit and I was sitting on the back patio, that's when I had the super realization that I'm in town to do business with Arnold and he likes me enough that he invited me to his personal friends, you know, Christmas party, which mm-hmm. I've continued to go through since, to, since that day. And that right there was the moment where I was like, I really can do anything. Yeah. And if I can't think that from now on, then what the fuck is my problem? Because there's no way in a fucking million years I thought I'd be sitting here. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. How you pivot from there, huh? Yeah, right? Yeah. Jeez. Anything else in this chapter, guys? I don't know. No, I think that was it. I think like that story is you know that that's the compound effect of getting the small wins, yeah. getting that little those little tastes of confidence that just keep over time to then there's one huge moment. Yeah. If you fucking nail that, then yeah, just like you said, like you can do anything. Well, and a couple things on that whole piece of like thought process around that was I cannot come out of this meeting and him not be my business partner. Mm-hmm. I will never not like I would hate it the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Cause there's only very few people that get to work with their actual idol the way that I was able to. And so like I knew going in that I was going to throw everything at it. Right. And just be myself and just, tr- I mean, I just thought to myself, like when I stand by Arnold, like nobody can talk shit to me. It's mm-hmm. just like, and then once you do that for a period of time, it's just the association is is epic. So I just knew how how important that was. I just had yeah. to get it done. Yeah, imagine if you'd have walked in there and not had confidence, how that would have went. If you wouldn't have been over prepared and had everything laid out and stuff like that. Let me tell you something about Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's the most confident person I've ever been around in my life. Don't you think he'd sniff that? Easily. I show him my abs on my phone when I see him at Christmas time. He knows what the fuck's up. Like, he knows I'm a confident <laughs> dude. <laughs> I'll be like, Arnold, all right, I'm getting ready to get out of here. Oh, by the yeah. way, here's my latest conditioning. He'd be like, oh, yo. You know, so, like, that's the thing is, like, he sniffed that that I operated, you know, in, in the same vein. Obviously, like, I want to grow up to be like him. But that's the that's the thing. Like, he can sniff that real quick. So. But it's important to underscore this was like what you said 15 years yeah. into your, you know, this would be like 2000, like probably 12 or 13, yeah, like 13 years in. Yeah. But like we keep saying like it was like about comp- 15 years since I started lifting and reading this stuff. Yeah. 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 Like the compounded effect, and everything, it all like, crescendoed all this, at that exactly. moment. You know what I mean? Of like, okay, just, here it is. here's your big shot. Here's the big game. Here's it is. Now, how are you going to perform? Mm-hmm. And I think when I, I'd already kind of tell myself like the gamer mentality type shit, like, you know, and that's why I started telling my kids the same thing. Like you show up when it's time, you know, I mean, I had to really throw it out there that the magazine made all the difference though. Yeah. It was huge. You were ready. Yeah, I was ready. Yeah. So, all right. Fuck. Yeah. Let's on to the next chapter.